Greetings. Uh, greetings to all our speakers, uh, panelists, and guests around the world. I am Amir Pasek, a dean of the world's first school of philanthropy that is devoted to research, teaching, and discovery about the roles of philanthropy in the world and in the human condition. Our master's program and professional development opportunities are available online worldwide. The school's research is conducted with a range of partners who seek to establish the facts that will help us better understand and deploy philanthropy for social good. The school publishes two major indices of global philanthropy, including the Global Philanthropy Tracker, which we will discuss today. We are honored to be partnering with the Department of State for this event. We're also grateful for the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the International Development Research Center in Canada, the John Templeton Foundation, and the Office of the Vice President for Research and the Office of International Affairs at Indiana University and the Chancellor of IUPUI. We also appreciate the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation support of the Global Philanthropy Environment Index, which will be released later this year. The 2020 Global Philanthropy Tracker highlights the significant and growing role of private philanthropy and other private sources of funding and investments in addressing global challenges, ranging from education to poverty, public health, and COVID-19, as well as the effects of climate change and many other issues. With $68 billion in cross-border charitable giving alone, the Global Philanthropy Tracker finds that private philanthropy, giving from foundations, corporations, and individuals, is roughly equivalent to the 74th largest economy based on 2018 GDP. The findings of the 2020 Global Philanthropy Tracker also suggest a growing role for new philanthropic actors and investment mechanisms to contribute to global development. Now, it is my honor to introduce Ambassador Marcia Abernicat, Senior Official for Economic Growth, Energy and the Environment at the US Department of State. She has prepared special remarks for this occasion. Marcia Bernicat, a career member of the Foreign Service class of Minister Counselor, is now serving as Senior Official for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, and Acting Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. Prior to this, she served as Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and Environment, as well as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. Ambassador Bernicat served as ambassador to Bangladesh and to Senegal and Guinea-Bissau. Previously, she was deputy assistant secretary in the Bureau of Human Resources, and domestically, she served in the Department of State as office director in the Bureau of South Asian Affairs. Ms. Bernicat was deputy chief of mission twice at the U.S. Embassy in Bridgetown, Barbados, and the U.S. Embassy in Lilongwe, Malawi. She was principal officer at the U.S. Consulate in Casablanca, Mar Morocco, Deputy Political Counsel at the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi, India, and Desk Officer for Nepal and India in the Bureau of Near East and South Asian Affairs. She is the recipient of the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award and numerous other awards as well. A native of New, New Jersey, Marcia Bernicat received a Bachelor of Arts in History from Lafayette College and a Master of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown. In 2018, she was awarded an honorary degree of Doctor of Public Service by Lafayette College. Prior to joining the Foreign Service, Ms. Pernicat gained private, private sector experience working for Procter & Gamble. Uh, her languages are French, Hindi, and Russian. Let us welcome Ambassador Bernicat. Thank you, Dean Pasek, for that warm introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marsha Bernicat, the Senior Official for Economic Growth energy and environment at the U.S. Department of State. I'm honored to provide remarks for today's event, where we will discuss the findings of the 2020 Global Philanthropy Tracker and the ways in which it can guide us to tackle a variety of global challenges, especially COVID-19 and its secondary impacts, which have transformed countless lives around the world. But amid the many challenges of this pandemic, we remain resilient as we work toward recovery and prepare for whatever the next crisis might be. Philanthropy brings unprecedented value to public-private partnerships and U.S. development assistance as a whole. The Global Philanthropy Tracker measures our response to national emergencies such as COVID-19 and helps us understand where philanthropic dollars are going and in what areas they are needed the most. The United States 
remains the world leader in global philanthropic spending. Now, the number of opportunities to collaborate with the US government to leverage philanthropic resources to address US foreign policy goals is growing rapidly. These partnerships can come from a variety of sectors, such as foundations in the social sector, companies in the private sector, and academic institutions in the education sector, and carry the benefit of leveraging the unique convening power of the US government to engage stakeholders in targeted countries and regions. In enthusiastic recognition of the growing role of business, philanthropy, and civil society in global development, the Department of State created the Office of Global Partnerships to lead efforts to engage private sector stakeholders where their interests overlap with US foreign policy priorities. Launched in 2008 on the recommendation by the Advisory Committee for Transformational Diplomacy, we build and facilitate partnerships that harness the technology, markets, and resources of the private and civil society sector. Our partnership with the Indiana University Lilly Family School uh, Philanthropy in promoting the tracker and its findings is a prime example of a nonprofit organization and federal government working together to leverage resources and achieve shared goals that have global effects. Please share the tracker broadly within your networks and use its data to support your strategic objectives in making the world a better place. But let's not stop there. I'd like to also encourage you to explore with the Office of Global Partnerships where we have overlapping interests and to join us in building partnerships to recover from the pandemic, address climate change, and promote sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Bernicott. Uh, next, we will hear remarks from uh, Elizabeth Cousins, President and CEO of the United Nations Foundation. Elizabeth Cousins became the UN Foundation's third president and chief executive officer in 2020, leading the foundation's next generation of work to support the United Nations. Prior to becoming president and CEO, Dr. Cousins served as deputy CEO, where she oversaw the foundation's policy, advocacy, and communications work. Dr. Cousins has been at the forefront of global policymaking and innovation for over 20 years. She is a diplomat and thought leader who has worked on the front lines of peace processes, playing an influential role in US policy innovations from peace, peace building to the sustainable development goals. And she helped build private public partnerships to solve global challenges at scale. Before joining the foundation, she served for several years at the US mission to the UN. She was principal policy advisor and counselor to the permanent representative of the US to the UN and later served as the US ambassador to the UN Economic and Social Council, as well as alternative representative to the UN General Assembly, where she led US negotiations on the SDGs, serving on the boards of US agencies, funds, and programs, and was also US representative to the UN Peacebuilding Commission. She has lived in around the world, serving in US missions in Nepal and the Middle East, and worked as an analyst in conflict zones, including Bosnia and Haiti. Dr. Cousins has a DPhil in international relations from the University of Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar, and she has a BA in history and an honorary doctorate from the University of Puget Sound. She has written widely on conflict management, peace processes, state building, and the UN. Please welcome Dr. Cousins. Uh, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dean Pasek. I am absolutely delighted to be here to see a number of close friends and colleagues, and congratulations again on the Global Philanthropy Tracker. It is such an important contribution and a really practical tool for all of us who deeply believe in the power of philanthropy and in the urgency of tackling global challenges at scale. So thank you so much for that. If there was ever a year that revealed the scope of the challenges we face, 2020 was clearly it. 80 million people were forcibly displaced worldwide last year. Famine and food insecurity doubled from pre-COVID levels to 270 million people. Tens of millions of people are being pushed back into extreme poverty. We see the relentless pace of climate-related disasters. And of course, COVID-19 has reached nearly every corner of the globe. You know, COVID is probably the first time since World War II that the world's entire population has experienced the same phenomenon, not just at the same time, but in real time. Even if we know that the impacts of the pandemic have obviously been very different in different places and for different people. 
all of that should bring home to us all that we have an individual stake in collective solutions. And we need to get resources to the right places with efficiency and scale to better the lives of as many people as possible. So your report is such a huge shot in the arm because it just shows the potential to tap a wider flow of resources for our collective needs. So it's really exciting. So let me just say a brief word <clears throat> about the UN Foundation. And I wanna tell you a little bit about our experience last year with something called the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund which was a new type of fund that we created for the World Health Organization at the earliest stages of the pandemic. So the UN Foundation, UNF, was created 20 years ago out of a billion dollar gift from Ted Turner to be a strategic partner and innovator to support the UN and its highest priorities. And over the years, we've worked on a wide range of issues in a variety of ways, including with WHO. And at the start of the pandemic, WHO reached out to ask us to help them. Could we create and implement a novel mechanism to mobilize and disperse flexible funding from as many quarters as we could find it to jumpstart the global pandemic response? They needed flexible funding and they needed fast funding to meet the changing demands of this rapidly spreading pandemic. And they knew that their traditional donors, governments, would eventually mobilize funds, but were not likely to be able to mobilize them quickly enough or as flexibly enough. So together with the Geneva-based Swiss Philanthropy Foundation, we created the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. This was the first ever platform that could receive and disperse donations to WHO from individuals, corporations, foundations, and other eligible entities. We went operational in three weeks. We raised $100 million in two weeks. And in another month, we had crossed the $200 million mark. This surprised all of us, but we turned on every spigot from online donations, uh, matching grants, employee giving. We worked with online gamers to mobilize their community to give. And the total in the fund to date is $238 million, which has been raised from over 650,000 individuals, foundations, and companies from 190 countries. The fund has been among the top three donors to the WHO for COVID response since the beginning of the pandemic, and it quickly became the fastest method of dispersing money to the most urgent needs. Now, the essence of this fund was cross-border. It was all about cross-border multi-sector giving, drawing on donors from all over the world whose gifts ranged from $3 to $10 million. And the impact of those contributions has been incalculable. So I'll just give you a few examples. WHO was only able to make its first bulk purchases of life-saving commodities, those masks, gowns, tests, gloves, uh, and distribute it to the most needy because of those 653,000 donors. The early seed funding for unprecedented global research collaboration around diagnostics and treatment, something called the Global Solidarity Trials, came from the fund. Solidarity flights that the World Food Program ran to get essential workers and supplies to hard hit areas were supported by the fund. And as countries have been able to repay early donations of supplies, it's actually become a revolving fund where we've been able to use the resources over and over for what the newest needs are. So altogether, those 653,000 contributors solved a liquidity problem that had plagued WHO for years, and it removed a crippling bottleneck in pandemic response. And we've learned a huge amount from this effort. We'd never done anything like it before, and we turned ourselves inside out to get it done, and we're still documenting, assessing, and learning lessons. But I'll just say by way of conclusion at the opening that you know, we were enormously humbled by this experience overall. Um, I can't tell you how many times from those early online donation pages, I would go and read the comments that people would make as they'd give very modest contributions, probably huge for them, um, where, where they would speak with solidarity and empathy about what people were going through in other corners of the world. And we just found that there was a, a wonderfully intrinsic appreciation in a lot of places that a disease anywhere is a disease everywhere. There was a deep value that people placed on solidarity. And we found that donors of all scales and in all places wanted to find a way to contribute to the solution to this most urgent problem. And the Solidarity Fund was just a way to do that. So it all says to us that there's so much generosity out there in so many places. And if you can find the right vehicles to tap that and give them a way to do good and feel good about the impact they're having, there's just tremendous scope um, for progress. So I'll leave uh, my opening remarks uh, with that. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Cousins. The the success of the Solidarity Response Fund is, is truly impressive, and it's wonderful to see this testament to the global distribution of generosity. So thank you so much. Uh, next, I would just like to uh, uh, acknowledge that we are joined today by a variety of officials serving uh, at different posts around the world, um, and that there are several international NGOs as well as philanthropy support organizations that are joining us today. So, so thank you for being with us. Now I turn uh, the floor over to Dr. Una Osuli uh, to present the findings of the 2020 Global Philanthropy Tracker. Una Osuli uh, serves as the Lilly Family School's Associate Dean for Research and International Programs. She's also Professor of Economics and Philanthropic Studies, and also serves as Dean's Fellow for the Mays Family Institute on Diverse Philanthropy. She is an economist with significant experience in research, as well as policy, and has worked on the fields of household behavior as well as economic policy. She is an internationally recognized expert on economic development and philanthropy and speaks across the global issues related to national and international trends in economics and philanthropy. She testified at the US Senate Subcommittee on the Role of Philanthropy and Remittances in Foreign Aid and has been quoted by international and national news media such as The Times, The New York Times, The Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and The Chronicle of Philanthropy. She has served as a member of several national and international advisory groups, including the African Development Bank, the Social Science Research Council, the UN Economic Commission for Africa, and the UN Development Program. Dr. Osili leads the research and publication of Giving USA, the annual report on American philanthropy. And beginning in 2016, she has led the research and publication of Global Philanthropy Tracker and the Global Philanthropy Environment Index. She has pioneered new approaches to using data to better understand global and national trends in philanthropy, including the Million Dollar List and the new Generosity for Life project. She earned her BA in economics from Harvard and her MA and PhD uh, from, in, in economics from Northwestern University. Una, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dean Pasig, for that generous introduction. And thank you to our distinguished panelists. It's truly an honor to join all of you. And uh, I wish we were able to do this in person. Um, I also want to acknowledge and appreciate all our audience members, many who have joined from around the globe. One benefit of this uh, virtual format is that we are able to convene uh, even with uh, the limitations of our time. Um, and with that, I'd like to share my screen. Um, uh, one of my colleagues was going to share the video very promptly about the Global Philanthropy Tracker. I don't know if, um, Amy, if you're able to do that. Otherwise, I will just go into the presentation. I think Kathy was pulling the link for that. So if you wanna go ahead and begin the presentation and then we can play the video. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay. yes we can. Wonderful. Well, welcome once again. And um, this is a great opportunity to acknowledge all of our partners around the world who've contributed to this um, worldwide comprehensive project called the Global Philanthropy Tracker. And many of you in the audience today are among the first to have this deeper dive into the data. As so many of our panelists have spoken on already, we live in unprecedented times. The scale and the scope of our challenges, whether the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and many other threats to our collective uh, human existence suggest that no one country can solve these problems on their own. And certainly no one region alone can tackle the scale. Um, the COVID pandemic is just one of many examples. Uh, what we've seen also in the face of so many challenges and perhaps one of the messages of today's um, presentation is we've also seen tremendous generosity and meant much of that reaching um, to the very heart of the challenges we face as a global community. In COVID-19, our team here at the Lilly Family School has had the opportunity to see philanthropy rise to these challenges in the areas of education, health, and even as we tackle environmental challenges. 
you already heard from Elizabeth Cousins about the role the UN Foundation has played in bringing people from over 190 countries to support uh, the World Health Organization's new foundation effort. With the uh, emergence of many of these cross-border challenges, there has been renewed interest in data on philanthropy. Our team has been inundated, I think, with questions about how much philanthropy is going to vaccine uh, education or how much is going into research or how much philanthropy is allocated towards climate change. What we've recognized is that there is a tremendous gap in the data and the knowledge of cross-border philanthropic contributions. Um, this is where the Global Philanthropy Tracker comes in. The goal of this project is to fill the gap that exists on how much is going across borders to support causes uh, ranging from global health, global education, and many other causes. Uh, this report, the Global Philanthropy Tracker, details the magnitude of cross-border philanthropic contributions, and we build on the great foundation laid by Dr. Carol Edelman and many others who worked on the Index of Global Philanthropy and Remittances. So with that, I also want to mention that one contribution of the Global Philanthropy Tracker, in addition to measuring and capturing the magnitude and complexity of cross-border flows, it presents these uh, not in isolation, but rather as part of a broader um, set of data. In, in other words, we're able to look at how philanthropy compares to official development assistance, private capital flows, and remittances from international migration. All of these uh, cross-border flows increasingly uh, need to be understood in order to better, uh, I think, navigate the challenges ahead. The Global Philanthropy Tracker, uh, for the first time, provides cross-border giving uh, from 47 economies. One of the main contributions of this project, in addition to providing this uh, foundational data is also to dispel an important myth. For a long time, we've tended to think of philanthropy as perhaps existing in certain parts of the world, but what our data shows that cross-border philanthropy is present in both uh, high-income countries, middle-income countries, and even um, among all levels of income, we see a commitment to philanthropy both within domestic borders, but also across uh, domestic borders and across regions. Now for the main results. Uh, the main results here is when we uh, track the, for the, uh, I guess the year where we have the most recent data, cross-border philanthropy amounts to $834 billion. This is likely to be an under, uh, sorry, uh, $68 billion, but official uh, flows, if we add up official development assistance, private capital flows, remittances, taken together, we would have cross-border uh, private resource flows, uh, accounting for the bulk of what takes place across uh, international borders. This is an important point that we want to underscore. In the past, official development assistance tended to be the largest slice of the pie. And over time, we've seen the private sector emerge as a big player in um, international development. So just to give, uh, give you those numbers again, the total amount of um, cross-border, you could say economic engagement is $834 billion. Much of that comes from the private sector with remittances from international migration uh, occupying a, a very important slice of the pie. ODA, uh, also a very significant, but as you can see, a smaller um, slice of the pie and private capital investment also uh, $109 billion. I want to also emphasize that what we've seen over time is growth in many of these private sector flows with ODA growing much more slowly. That is not to say, and I want to emphasize government still has a very important role to play in global development, but increasingly governments are working collaboratively as we've heard with the private sector, with private philanthropy, and also migrants from um, international across, uh, across borders, immigrants are also contributing to development projects in their countries of origin through uh, their remittances and other types of engagement. 
as we look ahead uh, from the current data, which is uh, in, in 2018, we see three key trends. And I want to emphasize how important these are because they will continue to shape what we see in terms of uh, global philanthropy across borders. The first is the rise of high net worth households in uh, many different countries, especially Asia, Latin America, to some extent, Sub-Saharan Africa, and also the growth of the middle class um, with the growth of private philanthropy in many parts of the world driven by these trends, we expect that uh, cross-border giving will continue, not just uh, at the levels we've seen uh, in 2018, but uh, going forward. It's also important to recognize that with um, the growth in philanthropy globally, there's also been an, uh, an expansion in the role that technology is playing. You already heard Elizabeth mention the mobile platforms, the crowdfunding platforms, but we've also seen complex set of tools and increasingly sophisticated tools being used uh, to drive cross-border giving. We expect that uh, the events of 2020 will likely accelerate these trends with many more individuals and organizations uh, giving across borders using uh, these complex tools. And in addition to the role that technology is playing, impact investing is also increasingly part of the cross-border landscape. The third trend and also uh, likely to, co to continue is the role of collaboration. We already highlighted that uh, COVID-19 has emphasized that no one country can solve the challenges we face alone, but we're also seeing that one sector alone cannot solve these problems. In other words, the private sector working uh, with governments at the national, in some cases uh, across a national, and also multilateral organizations are part of the collaborative efforts we've seen. And we've seen this in global health, but also in education, in climate change, and in many other areas. I should also mention that one of the top two top areas that we saw funding taking place was uh, global education and global health. And so those are also likely to continue given some of the issues we have seen during the pandemic. Now uh, let's turn our attention to where the gaps are. The biggest finding, and this is no surprise to many of you in the audience, is that when it comes to data on cross-border philanthropy, we have a long way to go. Of the 47 economies that we study, only 18 of them have high quality data on the aggregate amounts of philanthropic outflows. And when we try to identify causes that are supported by cross-border giving, which as I said, has been the number one question we've received, only 18 countries have deeper dives and disaggregated information on how much is going to specific causes, whether vaccine research, uh, vaccine education, or a climate change. Uh, we still have gaps. Um, in addition, when we look at where the recipients of those cross-border flows are, there's also very limited information. Uh, we can point to a few countries that stand out in terms of uh, making progress in this area. Uh, we saw very good data from South Korea, for example, no surprise there, uh, but also a lot of the Scandinavian countries are able to map their cross-border giving to SDGs. So there needs to be perhaps one big takeaway, more data on philanthropy, especially cross-border giving uh, across countries. What are the main implications of the data? This is a good time to issue a call to action for all of us. The first one is a need for more research, uh, more commitments to data tracking. We've seen that uh, because of the global health crisis that we face. Uh, but in addition to uh, building platforms for data, we also need to think about how as a, a global community, we can collaborate more, not just on uh, solving the problems that we face collectively, but also on building knowledge and learning. Uh, one of the highlights, I think, and very exciting components of the UN Foundation's work is their commitment to share what they have learned during the pandemic with other organizations, with other entities. And we think that deep learning is another um, across borders. A lot of innovation has taken place during the COVID-19 pandemic. We think that this is an opportunity, uh, perhaps a catalyst for change. In addition to chronicling these lessons learned, there's also an opportunity to share those lessons across borders. 
Finally, I just want to thank you all, all again for participating today, but emphasize that uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Global Philanthropy Tracker, all of this information is available on our website, um, globalindices.iupui.edu. In addition to the high level information that I've shared here, you can also learn about individual countries, um, the data that exists for countries across uh, the 47 that we include. In addition, you can also review um, the work on the Global Philanthropy Environment Index. Also want to thank our team. I think they are all on the call today uh, on the webinar. Kathy Kerrigan, Kinga uh, Horvath, and Coco Shaunanku, as well as uh, John Bergdahl, our statistician on this project. So at this point, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it back over to Dean Pasek. Thank you. Thank you so much, Una. Um, and uh, we will now proceed uh, to uh, our distinguished panel with us today to explore um, the uh, role of philanthropy and partnerships in, in meeting some of these uh, uh, global uh, challenges that you talked about. Um, um, I will offer just a one-line introduction as fuller descriptions of our distinguished panelists are available on the program website. I also want to encourage our guests and audience to put their um, questions into the question and answer box. Some of you have already been doing that, but hopefully we'll have some time for questions from the audience as well. Our friend, first panelist is Elizabeth Cousins, from, uh, you have, from whom you have already heard today. She is the president and CEO of the uh, UN Foundation. We are also honored to welcome Eileen O'Connor, who joined the Rockefeller Foundation in 2019 as a Senior Vice President, Communications, Policy, and Advocacy. Joining her is Jim Thompson, who is the Director for Private Sector Engagement at the U.S. Department of State's Office for Global Partnerships. Finally, we have Jacob Harold, who is Executive Vice President of Candid, where he leads Candid's analysis of the social sector, crafting raw data insights, in, uh, raw, uh, sorry, crafting raw data into insights, practices, and a shared narrative for the field. Uh, Una uh, will be moderating this discussion, so back to you, Una. Thank you again, Dean Pasek, and thank you so much to our panelists. I have to say that I am just so looking forward to uh, their contributions because each panelist brings a tremendous experience on these topics. We're going to start with Elizabeth Cousins. Uh, because of her experience working across sectors and across countries and building very complex collaborations, she already talked about her work uh, with the World Health Organization on building a foundation from, the, from scratch and uh, innovating during the pandemic. So Elizabeth, you're going to kick us off. And the question that I'd like you to, to speak to is that we've already uh, spoken about that uh, the challenges we face require new ways of thinking about collaboration. And COVID-19 has demonstrated that we cannot uh, simply proceed uh, with our models as usual. Based on the UN Foundation's experience, um, what lessons do you think uh, you can share on the role of multi-sectoral partnerships? What are some key challenges in, that you've encountered and what are the opportunities that lie ahead? Well, thank you so much, uh, Una. Let me make sure, yes, my mic is on. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to join this conversation. Um, well, and first I want to thank you for your acknowledgement in your remarks earlier. We really are committed to learning as many lessons, documenting everything in general in our experience, but especially around this um, exceptional last year and the work of the COVID fund. would be happy to share that out in general with people. And we're still in the middle of digesting it all, even while the fund remains live <laughs> still. Um, a few overall lessons, I guess I would say. I mean, first, I think when you're trying to bring sectors together, whether it's across geographies or literally across sectors or both, it is so important to have a clear sense of what you're trying to achieve. It's an obvious point, but so much effort, I think, ends up um, uh, sometimes being distracted in conversations about how to align and coordinate if you're not clear on the mission. So the first thing and what was very helpful with the Solidarity Fund was to have a very clear value proposition where you could say, this is the clear need, this is the instrument to solve the need, in this case, WHO and the global public health response, both them and their partners. And if we're able to mobilize funds and get them 
to them quickly and flexibly, this is what they're going to be able to do with them. And to be able to tell a clear story that's clearly true and convincing and be able to demonstrate that is enormously important in both building trust and also being able to mobilize very diverse um, partners who may have really different ways of thinking about problems, different cultures of decision making, all of that. Second, um, transparency, transparency, transparency is really, really important for these kinds of partnerships, again, and including a willingness to uh, to solve problems together when you encounter them, because of course you're going to find hiccups. You have to have a healthy appreciation for that and being able to go into a, a collaboration with real appreciation that you're committed to doing that together. A third big lesson for us, and this maybe won't be applicable every, every, everywhere, but certainly in this instance, it was so critical to be able to, to, to get from partners unrestricted contributions. Um, that has a unique value in an emergency context where you don't know every need every day. You just need to have the money available to direct it with, you know, on the right basis at the right time. Um, but I think it has a broader applicability across a lot of the areas that we all work on in various ways as philanthropies and organizations. It is increasingly hard to um, to advance and contribute to social change, to development, the more money is tied to very specific things. I think we all know the dimensions of that challenge and all of the reasons for it. I do think it's something that as a sector and across sectors, we really need a hard and honest rolling up our sleeves to look at ways to solve because I think we see in so many ways, whether it's the organizations that really need institutional support and critical issues, whether it's the timeframes of our giving, all of those, all of those dimensions of philanthropic and actually also official development assistance really need a hard look, given the magnitude of the challenges we're looking at as a world and that come home to roost very much also locally in our communities. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's it's so, um, I think, important to capture the points that you've made. Uh, start with a clear objective in mind, have that value proposition, but also you mentioned building trust uh, across partners and uh, the importance of unrestricted support, flexible funding, and sort of the need for philanthropy to be agile and uh, flexible in the face of these sort of evolving and cascading challenges. So I have taken away quite a few points from listening to you. We're going to turn our attention to Eileen O'Connor, who um, I have had the pleasure of getting to know in preparing for this event. And uh, very interesting work that the Rockefeller Foundation has been engaged with, really, um, I'd say cutting edge um, thinking and innovation, especially around global health data. Um, understanding that even in the United States and around the world, uh, the pandemic has exposed gaps in our ability to gather data in the arena of global health and to using that data make timely and informed decisions. So I'm going to turn to you to share just uh, some of the high level points you already shared with some of us who know your work and um, what has really uh, been the, I'd say driving force for the work that you're doing now, um, both working in the US and around the globe. Well, uh, thank you so much for that. I, I think that you know we, our work is really based on still on the five principles that J.D. Rockefeller had in establishing the, the foundation. And, and one of that is actually partnership among unlikely partners um, and the ability to base your decisions on, on the problem, analyzing the problem in a very data-driven way, and then using innovation and science to solve the problems, but also figuring out a way that you can actually exit. Philanthropic dollars should be able to catalyze other partners, other financial partners, and then also be able to figure out a business plan so that the, these dollars can actually exit the scene and go on to work on something else that is needed, filling in gaps. So in the case of COVID-19, particularly in the United States, most of our work in the health area and public health um, lately has been internationally. I mean, the Rockefeller Foundation is known for actually having established the area of public health early on in, in our history. So, so when we saw, but we've been working lately, as you said, on the, on the idea of precision public health, because data analytics and big data gives us the ability now to basically take 
lots of different public health problems and analyze them in a way that we've never been able to do before, in a way that the private sector and businesses use all the time, which this big data analytics. So we realize that just as you know, during Ebola, when the United States led in the uh, in that in that area and trying to overcome that epidemic, which could have become a major pandemic, um, it was data first. Uh, the Obama administration used a very data first, and one of the key areas of that was testing and tracing, and trying to be able to get testing time down to four hours from what had been four days, and to figure out through the contact tracing, how is this disease being spread? So data was so critically important to this pandemic and still is in overcoming the pandemic. So we realized early on that unfortunately in the United States, whereas in other countries, testing was going on, and those were the countries, the ones that tested the most, got over the pandemic much more quickly, had a lot less uh, casualties. So we realized that we needed to get out and actually help because there was a huge gap with the government not taking charge of this. So we worked with the federal government. We worked with Admiral Girard, who was the sort of testing czar and the, the COVID czar at HHS. And we really also convened all sorts of experts from economists to epidemiologists, to infectious disease docs, to the lab, manu to labs, to testing manufacturers and brought them all together. And whereas a lot of people had been talking about what should be done, we talked about how to do it. And, um, and I think that that's where philanthropy and philanthropic dollars can be actually used is really filling a gap and also sometimes at a catalytic, uh, as catalytic and concessionary capital. So for example, one of the problems with testing was that once a vaccine comes, the market place feels like there's no market. So one of the things we also did was use some of our capital to put an advanced purchasing agreement out so that the testing manufacturers would feel confident that their orders, that their, their uh, products would be bought. And right now the Biden administration is actually taking that on, taking that over. And, and we also formed a partnership of 30 states and help them to pull procurement so they wouldn't be doing what had happened early on with PPE and fighting with each other over and ratcheting up the cost, not just in the United States, but globally, and um, for PPE. And with the same was gonna happen with testing. So I think that's where it's really critical is that philanthropy can pull a lot of people together. We're not partisan, we're not political. We take great pride in, in trying to inform on the problem trying to bring solutions to the problem by forging partnerships, pulling in expertise, which is a big part of our history, is convenings and bringing together unlikely partners who probably don't agree, but can come up with the best solutions and hopefully solve some big intractable problems. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I think you have really summarized how the Rockefeller Foundation has been a partner in identifying gaps and then uh, scaling efforts um, to combat the pandemic and you've moved very flexibly. So there's, a, I think this idea of adapting your strategy to meet the needs of the time, um, there are a lot of takeaways there. We're going to turn to Jim Thompson now, who as you already heard um, is well positioned to answer this question, uh, one of the hallmarks of the times that we're living in is innovation. Uh, I wondered if you could speak to the importance of philanthropy as a partner to the government and where you see public-private partnerships uh, really playing a role in responding to the complex nature of the challenges that we face. Great, well, thank you, Anna, and thank you uh, to the University of Indiana uh, the Lee Family School for this incredible report. It is uh, really informative for us in the U.S. government to remember that we are not alone, um, that we need to work through and with others to get our work done. Um, and I think this report, you know, clearly demonstrates that our official development assistance doesn't operate in a vacuum. Um, and I just want to step back and just say, you know, one of the most important changes over time is the growth of the philanthropic sector and others that are investing in the developing world, whether that's through private sector investment or through philanthropic giving or through remittances. 
Um, if this same report was done in the 1960s and 1970s, what we had seen was, you know, our official development assistance in the 60s and 70s was the predominant uh, resource flow from the U.S. to developing countries. And now today, we're a smaller minority shareholder, particularly when you look at things like remittances um, and, and philanthropic giving overall. Even if you just take like the largest foundation that we all can think of off the top of our heads, if you say the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, that's a $50 billion endowed foundation. And they spend $5 billion a year um, doing programming around the world. You realize that that puts them ahead of Spain, Australia, and Switzerland as a donor. So you have to start to think differently about who your partners are. It can't just be countries, and it can't just be the countries that are the recipients. You need to think about who else is at the table, who else can bring those resources to bear. And I, I, I love the fact that Elizabeth brought up the, the point of you know, unrestricted giving. The US government's resources are extraordinarily restricted. Um, we get funding, it doesn't come just as green uh, US dollars, it comes with all kinds of stipulations around how we use those funds. Um, so if you're programming in Mozambique, you might just at, the, at an embassy level or at USAID mission level, you might just get a health budget. Um, that might be the predominant uh, uh, amount of resources that you get. But your real challenge is to, um, on the economic front, you need to somehow spur the economic development and that's gonna impact your health outcomes. So we really do need to think about, okay, if we have health resources, maybe we have that covered, but who else can help us with the economic uh, needs in the country? And that's where you start to think about who else is at the table? What other countries are there? What philanthropy can do? What private sector is doing? And I love the work that we do at the State Department because we have our embassies and the ambassadors were able to convene people together um, to, to share what we have and to talk about how we all can address these things in a holistic way. And I just wanna say foundations can fill these critical gaps, um, but they also can take risks that we can't take in government. Um, and I love that you know the Rockefeller Foundation is headed by a former US government official, Rajiv Shah, um, obviously, Elizabeth Cousins at the UN Foundation, uh, having previously been a diplomat as well. So we, we are amongst family here. Um, but one of the things I'll press upon our foundations to do, please take the risks that we can't take in government. You know our restrictions. You know that anything that we spend out of the U.S. government resources has to come uh, from Congress and that we report back to Congress. We can't report on losses and, and hope that we get the resources the following year. So we, we invite you to take those risks that we can't take um, uh, and to work with smaller organizations that we can't fund, organizations that, can't, uh, that don't have the capacity to respond to US government assistance or accept US government assistance. Um, take the innovation risks that we can't take uh, and then bring those, um, those examples of your successes back to us so that we can take those things and bring them to scale. I think those are the most important things. And I, I just wanna mention, we've done tremendous work with the UN Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation over time. Uh, we continue to work with them on our Girl Up program and our, our Women in Science STEM camp. Um, and our Global Equality Fund is another one where we work closely with the foundations where they're able to provide resources. So I, I'll, I'll challenge you, you can program through the US government too. So look, look at us not as just as a partner, but as, a, as an opportunity to leverage your resources from philanthropy. Excellent. Uh, Jim, you have covered so much ground. I'll just try to summarize a few points that are really important takeaways. Um, the importance of risk, risk taking private philanthropy as a partner, but also the ability to take risks and the importance of funding grassroots organizations. I think you touched on that. And finally, you hinted at this, but I wanna lift it up, the role that philanthropy can play in rising to the challenges of our time around inequality and many other systemic challenges. So with that, I'm going to give uh, Jacob Harold uh, an opportunity to uh, also weigh in Candid has been at the forefront of increasing uh, knowledge and data availability on so many questions that we've had very little information about. Um, so data availability, I think, is certainly an issue that we've raised. But beyond having the data, there's also the question of 
how can we act on that data? So having the data is not enough. So I'm going to ask uh, Jacob to uh, tell us what he thinks the role of data and the limitations of data in addressing some of the challenges that we face as a global community. Well, thank you, and it's it's great to, to be here. And you, Candid was formed two years ago by the, the merger of GuideStar and Foundation Center fundamentally rooted an idea of bringing different data sets together. And you know, we love data, but especially when it helps tell a shared story. And that's what I want to talk about a bit here. And step back and think about our shared story as a society right now. And in particular, how we understand the roles and responsibilities of different institutions in our society. Or, or to put it another way, what is the social contract in 2021? And I, I think we all see how the social contract is in flux right now. Um, and we see um, identities and roles and responsibilities changing. We see tech companies regulating the public square. We see new kinds of government intervention in the marketplace. We see new kinds of civil society engagement in politics. We have tools that mix across different sectors, whether that's impact investing or social business or social impact bonds or other forms of public private partnership. And you know, I'll just speak for myself and say that I'm dizzy. Um, and I, I don't think I'm alone. There's collective confusion about the social contract right now. And um, I think that will continue to be true. And it's part of the human experiment of figuring out what we're gonna do here on this planet. But data can help ground us um, and, and to root our uh, our conversations um, about the future of the, the, the social contract. And I think what's valuable here is it's not just about the institutions by themselves, but it's about the, the flow of resources among them that, that you know, essentially we are metabolizing money to make a better world. Um, and that is happening at a scale and a level of complexity that most people simply don't understand. Even many people who are the elites of our society at you know, major institutions, uh, in the media, in academia. Um, and we need, I think, collectively to figure out how to, how to tell this story in, in a different way. And you know, the, the Global Philanthropy Tracker helps to highlight some of these aspects that often get lost and I think are so important for us. Um, and you know, especially as we've tackled uh, the challenge of COVID-19, which you know, may well only prove to be a practice round for even greater challenges like, like climate change. So my hope is that we're able to use data in very practical ways to make concrete day-to-day -day decisions, but also to root these bigger conversations that, that I think we need to, to be having right now about, about who does what in our society. Thank you so much, Jacob. I have had the pleasure of working with you on so many projects and you always bring such clarity to very complex issues. So we don't have a lot of time left, but I'm just going to ask our panelists to share one word or maybe one phrase uh, when they look ahead, what gives them hope in uh, the world's ability to meet these challenges? Where do you see uh, some of the best opportunities? And just one word or a phrase very quickly, and then we will turn it back over to Dean Pasek. I don't know who wants to jump in first. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I think that the COVID, um, the pandemic has has shown a bright light on the inequities around the world that we all have been working on for so long. And I am very hopeful that finally um, governments that and people will understand that there is a role for government and that government is not bad and government dollars are not bad and helping others helps all of us. So I would say that, um, that you know, equity at the forefront is the word that I would hope will be the concentration in the future. Elizabeth, I can see you're ready to go. So uh, please no, jump in. I, I mean, a thousand percent agree with, agree with Eileen. I mean, I think that COVID has been a wake up call uh, of comprehensive proportions, as have as um, the recognition about racism in the United States and worldwide, and the equity um, um, 
gaps that are so, so corrosive. I, I actually, to, I'm, to me, this is really, this is a moment for solidarity. People are expressing it. People need to show it more. Solidarity is both about solidarity. It's also about self-interest. I think people are understanding that we are interconnected as a world. And the only way we thrive in future generations is if we solve these collective challenges working deeply and in fresh ways together. And um, I just, I, you know, that to me is the exciting moment we're in. It's a perilous moment as well. But I think with with all of the kinds of things we've been talking about here today, there is every reason to believe we do have the ammunition and ingredients to solve these challenges together. And it's just a question of organizing ourselves uh, with intent to do so. Jacob, I, I see that you're ready. <laughs> sure, the phrase I'll share is, is data standards, that if we pull it off, if we get it right, data standards create a common language to reveal diversity. And you know, that's the key is that it is not trying to jam everyone in the same box, but to show how we all are different and have different roles. Jim, you have the last word or phrase. <laughs> I, I'd say leadership. I think this is a really an important time for new leadership to step up uh, and to create the change that we all need. Um, this is unprecedented times that we are living in uh, going through this pandemic, uh, it obviously, the pandemic does not end at our borders. It did not begin at our borders. Um, and as the mutations uh, crop up with COVID-19, we really need to have a concerted effort to stamp out the disease across the world before it mutates further. Uh, and that's gonna take leadership from not just the United States, but all over the world and everyone working together to prevent the spread. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Dean Pasek to close us out. Well, uh, thank you, Una, very much. And, and thank you to our panelists, to Elizabeth, Eileen, Jim, and Jacob. This was a, a fascinating conversation. I think uh, uh, the sense of discontinuity and the sense that we're remaking who we are and how we're connected to each other in fundamental ways shows the importance for more data on the civic sector. We're, we're making great advances with the work that you you're and your team have done, Una, and the panelists in their contributions as well. But we still have a lot to do to catch up at least with the volume and the connectivity of data that it's available to the commercial sector and the public sector. So I think these are important partnerships that we have forged. Unfortunately, we're not gonna make it to any questions and there's a, a robust uh, exchange of questions and answers in the chat room. So that tells me that there's an appetite to continue this conversation. And uh, there are a lot of important uh, consequences that hang on us continuing this conversation as well. So I wanna thank all of our guests, our audience for joining us. I want to thank our partners at the Office of Global Partnerships for helping us to share the research that can help address pressing global problems. And we look forward to staying in touch and supporting all of your work as we go forward. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.